Greetings. I hope all is well today. Uh, it's Thursday, April 2nd, and I hope everyone is having a wonderful and blessed day. Uh, my name is Dr. Helen Tinsley, and I'm here to present story to you. Uh, again, this is day 18. Happy to be here with you. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. In the stories that I read every day. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another day of story time. Hi, Valerie and Olivia. I have to meet this little girl one day. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I have some great stories to read to you today. Um, I just want to say I hope everyone's having a, a great day, keeping your spirits high. Faith over fear. Faith over fear. Oh, hi, Olivia. She's singing the theme song. I love it. Mwah. Let's be faithful. Let's be uh, focused. And let's be productive while we're home. So the first story is called The Big Orange Splot by Daniels, Daniel Manis Pinkwater. The Big Orange Splot. <clears throat> oh, and as you see, you see my notes? I'm an educator. So I've used these books for training for adults, for training for, I mean, for teachers and administrators and different activities. So for those teachers watching, if you have little uh, essential questions that you wanna ask students when you read a story that you might not remember, put them on a post-it and either put it on the back of the book or put it inside. And then when you're reading the story, you can say, oh, ask them a different question. So just a little reading tip for those teachers or parents at home. The Big Orange Splot. The Big Orange Splot. Mr. Plumbean lived on a street where all the houses were the same. He liked it that way. So did everybody else on Mr. Plumbean Street. This is a nice street, they would say. Then one day. Oh, I'm trying to see. Then one day, a seagull flew over Mr. Plumbean's house. He was carrying a can of bright orange paint. No one knows why. And he dropped the can, no one knows why, right over Mr. Plumbean's house. It made a big orange splot on Mr. Sunbean's house. Ooh, too bad, everybody said. Mr. Plumbean will have to paint his house again. I suppose I will, said Mr. Plumbean, but he didn't paint his house right away. He looked at the big orange splot for a long time, then he went about his business. The neighbors got tired of seeing that big orange splot. Someone said, Mr. Plumbean, we wish you'd get around to painting your house. Okay, said Mr. Plumbean. Oops, sorry. <clears throat> he got some blue paint and some white paint, and that night he got busy. He painted at night because it was cooler. When the paint was gone, the roof was blue, the walls were white, and the big orange spot was still there. Then he got some more paint. He got red paint, yellow paint, green paint, and purple paint. In the morning, the other people on the street came out of their houses. Their houses were all the same, but Mr. Plumbean's house was like a rainbow. It was like a jungle. It was like an explosion. There was the big orange splot. 
and there were little orange spots. There were stripes. There were pictures of elephants and lions and pretty girls and steam shovels. The people said, Plum Bean has popped his cork, flipped his wig, blown his stack and dropped his stopper. They went away muttering. That day, Mr. Plum Bean boy bought carpenter's tools. That night he built a tower on the top of his roof and he painted a clock on the tower. The next day, people said Plum Bean has gushed his mush, lost his marbles, and slipped his hauser. They decided they would pretend not to notice. That very night, Mr. Plum Bean got a truck full of green things. He planted palm trees, baobabs, thorn bushes, onions, and frangipani. In the morning, he bought a hammock and an alligator. When the other people came out of their houses, they saw Mr. Plumbing swinging in a hammock between two palm trees. They saw an alligator lying in the grass, and Mr. Plumbing was drinking lemonade. Plum Bean has gone too far. This used to be a nice street. Plum Bean, what have you done to your house? The people shouted. My house is me and I am it. My house is where I like to be. And it looks like all my dreams, Mr. Plum Bean said. The people went away. They asked the man who lived next door to Mr. Plum Bean to go and have a talk with him. Tell him we all liked it here before he changed his house. Tell him that his house has to be the same as ours so we can have a nice street. <clears throat> the man went to see Mr. Plum Bean that evening. They sat under the palm tree drinking lemonade and talking all night long. And what do you think happened? So the man went over there, had a talk with him. Let's see what happened. That's what we call prediction. When you ask a child, what do you think will happen next? It's a teacher in me. Early the next morning, the man went out to get lumber and rope and nails and paint. When the people came out of their houses, they saw a red and yellow ship next door to the house of Mr. Plumbean. What have you done to your house? They shouted at the man. My house is me and I am it. My house is where I like to be. And it looks like all my dreams, said the man who had always loved ships. He's just like Mr. Plumbean, the people said. He's got bees in his bonnet, bats in his belfry, and knots in his noodle. Then one by one, they went to see Mr. Plumbean late at night. They would sit under the palm trees and drink lemonade and talk about their dreams. Dreams, And whenever anybody visited Mr. Plumbean's house, the very next day that person would set about changing his own house to fit his dreams. Whenever a stranger came to the streets of Mr. Plumbean and his neighbors, the stranger would say, this is not a neat street. Then all the people would say, our street is us and we are it. Our street is where we like to be and it looks like all our dreams. And that my dear friends is the end. The big orange splot. So this book is all about conformity. 
So for young children, what it means is you don't have to do things to be like everybody else. Be yourself. Whoever you are, be yourself. Be the best that you can be. You don't have to have what the next person has. You don't have to do the same things the next person does. I didn't know that as a little girl. There were people I wanted to have everything they had. And over time you learn, but be the best you can be because you're a unique, uh, wonderful individual and God loves you just the way you are. So remember that when you think about the big orange spot. So let me say hello. Hi, Val. Olivia, I love you too, sweetie. Hey, Carolyn. Hi, Aunt Carol. Hi, Catherine. And hi, Kathy. Tell Oswald I said hello. And Carolyn, tell Kalia I said hello. Those are parents whose children I taught many, many years ago, but lifelong friends and um, schoolmates as well. So I have two more books to read to you. This next book is going to seem kind of strange because it's a winter book and it's spring, but it's a very important book. And I'm going to share why I'm going to read the book. The book is actually called The Snowy Day by Ezra Jack Keats. The reason I'm reading it in spring is because in this uh, channel, I want children to understand the importance of story and I want families to understand the importance of story. And The Snowy Day is the first mainstream book that was published that featured a black character, the boy Peter. And so this is a very important book even though it's an old book and it's a winter book. And then I'm gonna read a book about the author of the book, The Snowy Day by Ezra Jack Keats. I love to read this book to my class when it was a snowy day and we're gonna enjoy it in spring. The Snowy Day. One winter morning, Peter woke up and looked out the window. Snow had fallen during the night. It covered everything as far as he could see. After breakfast, he put on his snowsuit and ran outside. The snow was piled up very high along the street to make a path for walking. Crunch, 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 his feet sank into the snow. He walked with his point, his toes pointing out like this. He walked with his to toes pointing in like this. Then he dragged his feet slowly to make tracks and he found something sticking out of the snow that made a new track. It was a stick, a stick that was just right for smacking a snow-covered tree. Down fell the snow, plop, on top of Peter's head. He thought it would be fun to join the big boys in their snowball fight, but he knew he wasn't old enough, not yet. So he made a smiling snowman and he made angels. He pretended he was a mountain climber. He climbed up a great big tall heaping mountain of snow and slid all the way down. He picked up a handful of snow and another and still another. He packed it round and firm and put the snowball in his pocket for tomorrow. Then he went into his warm house. He told his mother all about his adventures while she took off his wet socks. And he thought and thought and thought about them.
Before he got into bed, he looked in his pocket. His pocket was empty. The snowball wasn't there. He felt sad. When he slept, he dreamed that the sun had melted all the snow away. But when he woke up, his dream was gone. The snow was still everywhere. New snow was falling. After breakfast, he called to his friend from across the hall and they went out together in the deep, deep snow. And that's the end. And this is the snowy day. When you see this circle, this is a Caldecott honor winner. So this book has won a national award. And the snowy day is the most checked out book in the New York Public Library today. So the reason I share this book in winter is because of how important this book is. Um, the author, Ezra Jack Keats, was an, uh, a Jewish man from New York that published that book. And uh, a writer, Andrea Davis Pinckney, wrote a store, a poem, a book called A Poem for Peter. And it's really a tribute to Ezra Jack Keats. And so I'm gonna read to you A Poem for Peter the story of Ezra Jack Keats and the creation of the snowy day. Before I read it, I wanna point out that in the snowy day uh, was the first book that introduced Peter, but Ezra Jack Keats wrote all of these books featuring the character of Peter. Whistle for Willie, Peter's Chair, Goggles, A Letter to Amy, and Pet Show. So there are six books in the series that involve the, uh, the boy Peter, who's the first black character to be in a mainstream published children's book. So I bring to you a poem for Peter, the story of Ezra Jack Keats and the creation of the snowy day. <clears throat> Brown sugar boy in a blanket of white, bright as the day you came onto the page from the hand of a man who saw you for you. Long before you arrived, little brown sugar child, he was born, came to this world in the middle of March, that time between a lion and a lamb. Yes, yes, he was born with a roar that would someday celebrate the making of a brown sugar boy on a snowy day. You and he, different but the same in so many ways. This wriggly baby was the youngest of three. First came sister May, a feisty girl, then brother Willie, a quiet dreamer, then came he. Jacob, Jack, Ezra Katz, born under hardship's hand into a land filled with impossible odds. <clears throat> His parents, Benjamin and Gussie, were Polish immigrants. Each fled Warsaw, Benjamin first and Gussie, journeyed westward on a big boat packed tight with others like them, wanting a new life, bound for America where they prayed no one would prey on Jews as they done back in Poland. They leapt into, onto American soil, eyes filled with expectation, looking to see this home of the free, this united land of opportunity. Benjamin and Gussie settled in Brooklyn where they had to hunt for what was good. There wasn't much prospect in this Brooklyn place, jobs, scarce, poverty, plenty. This dark heel of discrimination dancing in the streets of what was now their home, East New York, Brooklyn's poorest part of town in 1916 when Jacob Jack Ezra Katz was born. <clears throat> but when it snowed, oh, when it snowed, nature's glittery hand painted the world's walls a brighter shade. Snow made opportunity and equality seem right around the corner. Because you see, snow is nature's we all blanket. When snow spreads her sheet, we all glisten. When snow paints the streets, we all see her beauty. 
Snow doesn't know who's needy or dirty or greedy or nice. Snow doesn't choose where to fall. Snow doesn't pick a wealthy man's doorstep over a poor lady's stoop. That's Snow's magic. Benjamin Katz made meager wages as a waiter at Pete's Coffee Pot in Greenwich Village. Each day, Ezra's daddy served and smiled for the busy city people who didn't always tip. This hardworking man, his apron stained with fried grease, and the longing for something better than his battered flat on Vermont Street. Miss Gussie was a strong-willed woman with a paintbrush she mostly kept secret. Ma Gussie, a woman with hushed up wishes of becoming a fine artist. Fine as in cultured. Fine as in refined. Fine as in beauty for beauty's sake. But Ma Gussie could never utter her fine, fine wishes she was forced to bite down on her dreams. This made her bitter, a way Ezra never wanted to be. When Ezra turned eight, he took a page from life's book of hard wanting. He swiped the sheet of what it might, of what it might mean to become an artist, that unmutterable thing. As a third grader at PS 182, Ezra earned 25 cents for painting store signs. Did I skip a page? No. At, oh, so, excuse me. As a third grader at PS 182, Ezra earned 25 cents for painting store signs. His hands so steady, ready to show what he could do with a brush dipped in gold. Spelling, spiraling, inviting shoppers to buy. Pig's feet and sauerkraut, 25 cents. Pancakes and sausage, 15 cents. With shiny dimes pressed into his palm, Ezra Katz learned he had a gift for creating something that made people look. This was the answer to Papa Benjamin's prayers. His son could earn good money as a sign painter, but the child was cut from the patches of his mother's claw. He wanted to be a true artist. True as in the real thing. True as in letting imagination fly. True as in someone who does more than paint sauerkraut signs. Papa Benjamin worried about his son's dream, feared for what he couldn't see. An artist was a strange and practical thing to be. You couldn't earn a decent wage giving imagination wings. But even with these firm beliefs, Papa Benjamin had a soft spot. He brought home half-used tubes of paint from artists who hung around at Pete's Coffee Pot. Papa told little lies about the tubes with the colored hues. He couldn't admit he was also pinching from his own paycheck to buy pretty paints. He was too proud to confess to supporting a pipe dream that might never come true. With each tube of colored oil, Ezra let his imagination grow, and he drew, oh, how he drew, on paper bags and wood scraps and box tops and pillowcases and open palms and foot soles. Ezra's teachers helped his art star shine, he spent school days cutting, pasting, making collages, gluing torn swatches, squirting his oils onto sheets and sheets, onto please, oh please keep feeding me these. Thank goodness for teachers. Thank goodness for friends. Loved that boy, yes they did. Saw his gifts before he could. Teachers and friends, oh how they did. Teachers and friends, oh how they could. Bring out the good, the best of the best and Jacob Jack's, Jack Ezra Katz. Told Ezra, you've got a knack. Encouraged him, don't hold it back. Took Jacob Jack Ezra Katz by the hand like a pair of warm mittens and led him to a place of promise. The Brooklyn Public Library with this enchanted land called the reference room. And I'm gonna interrupt. I hope all children begun, began to recognize libraries as sacred places of knowledge. <clears throat> Ezra 
Ezra spent afternoons in that so special place, made an eager leap into le heaps of happy, landed onto piles of plenty, a pretty, excuse me, art books, plant facts, bug tales, maps, pages and pages of pictures and paintings, like the doors of that special so-called, of that so special place, open so wide, invited, ignited Ezra's imagination. Come child, fly. But with that bright art star, there soon came a crash. The stock market smashed. The Great Depression, bam, came on with a punch. Brought hard knocks, brought bad times, made the poor even poorer made sad an even bleaker shade of gray. By 1932, when Ezra was a student at Thomas Jefferson High School, the kid was pulling in prizes for his drawings and murals and etchings and oils. Then came Ezra's shantytown, a painting that showed it like it was. Let folks see, let them feel what the Great Depression's heavy hand had doled out to spare. Shantytown brought citations, applause, Helped Jacob Jack Ezra Katz graduate with honors and scholarships to art school. What's the painting? But on the day before Ezra's Jack graduation, Papa met Benjamin died of a heart attack. Ma Gussie sank into deep blue darkness. Ezra never got to wear his cap and gown. He kissed those scholarships a fast goodbye. Oh, such great disappointment out of school, out of work, out of luck, where to go, how to turn, how to know which way to turn when every avenue is a dead end street. Odd jobs put pennies in Ezra's pocket, let him patch together a living, let him catch his catch can, those petchy, Patchy catch pennies, paid the rent, brought some bread. Then like a friend who shows up with a gift, the art student's league said, come with me, handed Ezra a chance. The art student league, a playground for experimenting, a schoolyard of inspiration that introduced Ezra to the paintings of Mexican greats, Orozco, Rivera, Sequeiros. In the midst of the Great Depression, President Roosevelt promised a bread a day, shook hands with Americans, made a pact, gave his word on what he called the New Deal, spelled his promise with three letters, W-P-A, the Works Progress Administration. What a boom for Ezra Katz. The W-P-A meant a J-O-B, a job. The government paid artists to paint. Catch as, catch can, became paint for pay, good man. And so Ezra painted murals for the WPA. After that, he found a job as a comic book artist. He drew capes and crowns and shields and fists. He sketched marvels, he sketched villains and marvels and heroes. He inked and colored and told stories in strips. And that little child brought you one step closer. Let's Peter, yes, Peter, you. The brown sugar boy in a blanket of white began to ignite by what kids saw and didn't see in the not so funny comics, Ezra was made to draw. All the heroes in all the comics were always as white as a winter sky. Peter Child, you were not, you were so not anywhere among any superheroes. People wondered, how could this be? Why weren't you on the same pages among the other Marvels? But you, Coco Sprite, weren't far away. You a phony kid filled with brown sugar whimsy, a roly-poly celebration, a charming chubby bundle of boundlessness. You jumped up out in front of Ezra in a series of photographs from Life magazine. Your sweet cheek smile brought a sprinkle of joy. Ezra tacked those Life magazine brown sugar goodies on his wall where the photos would stay for 20 years. Even though the world was living in an age of color judgment, your color didn't matter to Ezra. 
All he saw was you, beguiling little guy with the smarty pants smirk, playing pretty boy peekaboo. An important thing happened around this time. War rose up throughout the world. Hitler, an evil beast of a man, was on a mission to read every crevice and country of all Jews and anyone else born with even a drop of difference. Uncle Sam pointed his finger, stared hard, told Ezra, I want you. Drafted him to quit. Drafted him quick and asked him to serve the red, white, and the blue. Ezra went proud to fight, eager to help him end Hitler's reign. Packed his pencils, brought his brushes, marched to the army, took his soldier shelf to the Air Force Division and served Uncle Sam a big dose of draftsmanship. World War II needed posters and booklets, needed charts, needed art, needed maps and pictures, drawn by the hand of a man whose lines and arrows sprang from the page to help soldiers leap to duty. After the war, Ezra did something many Jews did when the one ad said, no Jews need apply. To help himself get a job, Jacob, Jack, Ezra Katz rearranged his name, shortened that name, twisted its rhythm, helped it roll off the tongue. Yes, yes, Ezra Jack Keats had a nicer ring to it for some. It was a known name that only hinted at his heritage, only winked at where he'd come from, but never came out and said, Discrimination had formed Ezra's understanding of what it meant to be different. This also led to you, brown sugar boy. Back in his hometown, you gave a wave once again. Those life-affirming photos teased Ezra. They had been twinkling hello for so long, waiting to come to life, soon to change Ezra's life and ours. One day, Ezra was called, was asked to draw pictures for a children's book called Jubilant for sure. That was a very good year. 1954. It was a new beginning for Ezra Jack Keats. For sure, making art for children's stories was a jubilant reason to rejoice. Okay, maybe so, but the delight was all white. The books on the shelves made Ezra call out like a child, like a daddy, excuse me, looking for his lost child. Where are you? And he kept calling, kept asking, where are you? And then Ezra's invitation came to write and illustrate his own story. And then, oh, then you, you popped up. You, Ezra's true jubilation. You had been waiting to be born and yet you were there all along. Brown sugar boy in a blanket of white bright as the day you came onto the page from the hand of a man whose life and times and hardships and heritage and heroes and heart and soul led him to you. You, yes, you little boy were now in full view, Peter, no longer a glint in Ezra's eyes, but a child of glory, a a, excuse me, a curious child on a path to discovery. Like a snowflake, you fell right into our hearts. You arrived. A little snowy day surprise, like a crystal flake from the clouds. You fluttered down with your one of a kind cutie beauty. Yes, you, Peter Child, bubbled up in this man, now free to discover the truth of your colors. The here I am red, the look at me yellow, the proud to be brown. Yes, you, a bright-hooded hero, snow-suited crusader, crunching through your own quiet tundra of discovery. You, brown sugar boy with your black button eyes and hot cocoa nose. You, facing the cold with your matching mittens and tiny boots. You, Peter, a tiny mite where your own little whiz flying closer on snow angel wings.
Yes, yes, brown sugar boy, you are on your way, ready to run outside and play. You little one were filled with big dreams of a city sidewalk adventure. You, Peter, so eager to make new footprints in the clean, crunchy stuff beneath your feet. The time had finally come. It was 1962. Ezra Jack Keats did introduce us to you, Peter. Forging your path in knee-deep wonder, Peter. Welcoming us into your play, Peter. Marching out in a whole new way. With you, Ezra tore off the blinders, yanked up the shades, revealed the brilliance of a brown, bright day. Peter Child, you brought your stick. Yes, you did. Smack, smack to the tree. Some say you were whacking at ice-packed intolerance, shaking it loose from narrow-minded branches. When prejudice fell, you rolled it, packed it, put its snowball in your pocket of possibility where it melted away. Peter and Ezra, you made a great team. Together, you brought a snowstorm of dreams, a blizzard of imagination, flurries of fun, and soon readers called for more of where are you? And between you two, the one of a kind snowflakes kept falling onto sweet pages of brown sugar good. More neighborhood friends, more books with kids who answered, where are you? With, here we are. Yes, yes, this, they were, they were there too. Stories with Louise, Roberto, Jenny, tales of Amy, Archie, Maggie, goggles, a hat, a pet show, a chair, pirates, skates, a man in the moon, a doggy named Willie and learning to whistle, a music box for finding a father, counting to one with a red on red sun. Those are all from Ezra's books. Ezra Jack Keats gave all of us a place, a face, a voice. Ezra Jack Keats gave, gave us eyes to see. Let us celebrate the making of what it means to be. He dared to open a door. He awakened a wonderland. He brought a world of white suddenly alive with color. Brown sugar child, when you and your hue burst onto the scene, all of us came out to play together, flapping our wings, rejoicing in a we all blanket of we. Thanks to Ezra Jack Keats, we all can be as bright as snow's everlasting wonder. And this is uh, in the end about Ezra Jack's legacy. So this is a poem for Peter. It was kind of long, but I thought it was very, very important because again, this book, this book changed literature for children in the United States and mainstream publishing. This is the first book, The Snowy Day, that showed a mainstream black character in a children's book. And that has opened the world for multicultural children's books. So many of the books that I share with you and I will share with you show uh, many different uh, characters of color of different ethnicities and different backgrounds and, and different uh, cultures and different features. And we have to give thanks to Ezra Jack Keats for having the vision and the fortitude to push forth to bring Peter to life in his first children's story. So our story was a little lengthy today, but I've enjoyed reading to you. Hi Val and uh, Judy has joined us and I see other people that join in, but I cannot um, see everyone while until I get off. So I appreciate your listening. I hope um, everyone has a blessed day. Enjoy the rest of your day. Again, to the children watching, I hope that you're using your art materials and your drawing and coloring and cutting and pasting. So just a tip for at home. If you have uh, children's safety scissors and glue, children can make collages with any type of paper. If you have newspapers, they can just tear it in strips, tear it in pieces. If you have old paper, magazines, they can cut pictures out and make collages. 
or if you just have construction paper, again, they can tear strips into different sizes and create what's called a torn paper collage. It's just another way to give children an opportunity to be creative at home. So until tomorrow, be well, uh, and God bless you all. Peace.